welcome, welcome, welcome to Trauma Informed Care for Educators. I've actually been waiting for this one in the mindfulness series because we've gone through so much collective trauma just as a community that I want to see what we can do to care for ourselves and care for our other educators and care for our students. So I cannot wait for this one. So welcome. I'm glad and happy to have you here today. I am Dr. Desiree Alexander. I am the founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consulting, and I'm so happy to bring you all of these amazing webinars almost every weekend. If you're watching us live, yes, you can get a certificate of a uh, participation. If you are watching us on the YouTube channel, unfortunately, you don't get a certificate, but you do get the knowledge. And if you look right under the video, whether you're on a phone, you may have to click the little arrow, or if you are on the computer, you can click show more, and you'll get the link to the resource and all kind of good stuff underneath the video. But this is how you can contact me. So here's my Twitter handle, my Facebook, Instagram, anything on social media, I'm Educator Alexander, except for Twitter and Clubhouse. I'm at Educator Alex because it doesn't allow me to put my whole name and my website and all that good stuff. So what are some webinars we have coming up? Wow, I thought you never asked. On Wednesday, we have Google Sheets are here. It's actually not an Educator Alexander, but a GEG Global. And if you haven't followed or know about the GEG Global group, they are amazing. So we're doing a Google Sheets webinar and you actually do not have to register, but if you go to my website and you click the link, it's going to bring you straight to where you can view it. So yay. And then we have Creating with Littles. That's our next webinar next weekend. So yay. I'm so happy to offer something for Littles teachers, but of course, anybody is welcome and you can modify. Then I am going to be um, guest presenting the digital equity cycle on the Heartland Area Education Agency webinar in April. Yay. And then we have the Power Up Conference, and I'm going to be doing a keynote there. And then we have Tanya coming on back for sensational social emotional learning practices for the educator in April. And then again in May, for the Zen Within workshop. And I love that we're doing that one in May is right in time for the end of school in either May or June, depending on when you when you end school, but it's right in time to start learning some of those things that can calm us down and bring us into the summer. Then we have engaging families in a socially distanced world. I just had someone tell me, I registered for that one because I really want to know how to engage my family during this time. And I was like, yay, yay, I'm so glad you registered. Um, inclusive collection for our librarians. And anybody that just wants to know about how to represent diverse voices. TGIF, thank Google is free in May, jamming with Jamboard. I think this one is about to sell out. Y'all better go ahead and get these free web webinars and go ahead and register. Then we have amplifying thinking routines using technology tools. Look at all of the awesome tools that she's going to be going through, y'all. I, I, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that one too. All right. I'm looking forward to all of them. Tech you can do. Now, Sarah came and did a webinar series for us last summer that was all about the intro to Google tools. Y'all, we had like 500, 600 people showing up. It was crazy. So, She's coming back this summer with docs, sheets, slides, forms, drawings, and Jamboarding sites, and she's going to be talking about leveling up. Now that we know how to use it, now that we're already through at level one, how do we go deeper with these tools? I am so excited about this. And if you're like, with well, Desiree, I'm still on level one. You have all of the videos you can access before. It's almost like binging a Netflix show. Binge all the videos and then come see these live. Yay! Then we have inclusion tech hacks. This is one of our newest ones that we just added. So come and find out how we can make sure that all of our students learn. Creating your digital library. Then we have EdChange Global, the original 24-hour virtual free summer conference is back July 23rd through 24th, and they're looking for presenters. We are looking for attendees, and we're looking for sponsors. So if you have that new book, you have something you want to represent, sponsor. 
And then we have financial literacy for educators. This is going to be a really good one. I cannot wait to, for that one either. And then we have back to school with Bunsy in August and infusing digital reading and writing tools, no matter how you teach, remote, blended, face-to-face, Dr. Hines has you all. So there you go. That's where we stopped for this year so far, but we will be adding some more. And I mean, that's a lot, right? So I'm going to shut my face and we're going to go ahead and get started with trauma-informed care for educators. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I want to first say again, Dr. Desiree Alexander, thank you so much for having me again. I appreciate you. So I think this is our fifth month together, um, bringing in part of the mindfulness series for educators. And I also want to say in advance that I have... some upper respiratory things going on. So forgive me this morning if I sound a little different or if I'm drinking hot coffee or cold water. So I'm mixing it up, Desiree. But this morning we are going to talk about trauma-informed care for educators. I love that you said um, also for recognizing trauma in ourselves and how we can have better tips for serving our students and our own children if we're parents. And the title that goes a little bit deeper that I wanted to come up with says an exploration into trauma triggers and persistence. A friend of mine actually uh, created this title and I loved it. So I said, I'm gonna use it for today too. Again, I'm Tanya Chapman Griffin. I'm a licensed prevention professional um, in the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. And I work for the eye care program and we focus on drug, alcohol and violence prevention. So thank you for having me, Dr. Desiree. Um, our mission statement with eye care, usually I talk a lot about my personal business, Curvy Girl Dance and Fitness, but today I'm going to dive into the eye care program mission and give more um, for educators. So our mission statement in our school system is to provide prevention education in the areas of alcohol, drugs, and violence um, prevention, and to to actually support students and families within the East Baton Rouge Parish community. There is no other program like the eye care program in the country. Um, Other school districts have social emotional learning. They may have um, school counseling focuses, social work focuses, but we focus strictly on drug prevention, alcohol prevention, and violence prevention. And we also do crisis response um, when needed, which unfortunately recently has increased. So our overall goal is to equip pre-K and 12th grade students and families participating in East Baton Rouge Parish and non-public schools. So that's also focusing help on charter, um, private schools and and supporting them in the knowledge and skills that to make healthy lifestyle choices. So what does that mean? We want to teach students how to identify that something may not be quite right within themselves and then also encourage them to learn more about healthy coping skills. And Desiree, right now, that is so important because we are going through, and I've heard this so many times, and you all all probably have too. We're going through unprecedented times. How many times have we heard that? Unprecedented times. So we also have to figure out how to have radical self-care and how to identify protective factors. And so that's what we want to go through today. Our 21st century mission statement, which I kind of covered already with the eye care program is to advocate for students, community, and staff to have safe, drug-free schools, and to empower families to just support one another. We provide resources, technology tools, so that's why Desiree and I are so close because that tech life is amazing, and we also support trainings in evidence-based prevention education. So thank you for having me. If you are interested in eye care, um, I know that we have people internationally, Desiree, so if you want more information just about prevention education and how you can support your staff members, your uh, parents, yourself, or your own children, feel free to reach out. We have resources galore. And even though we are based in Baton Rouge, we support all um, educators. So feel free to reach out if you need support or any, any information additionally. I love this quote. It says, do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. And so, I mean, right now I can even hear my voice. I'm like, I've fallen, but being with you all this morning, we are getting back up again every day. We are striving to be better educators. Um, 
better professionals, better parents, better friends, better daughters and sons. And so I really, really like this quote a lot. And it's by Nelson Mandela. So our objectives for today, we're going to discuss three types of trauma and also adverse childhood experiences. We're gonna identify internal and external triggers. We're going to dive a little bit back into mindfulness techniques and identify some for personal self-care. So if you missed the last few sessions, we're gonna kind of have a little taste, a sprinkle of those there. We're gonna identify self-care techniques to share with our groups and our students and discuss the importance of resiliency. And as you know, last time we talked about resiliency, the definition being being able to bounce back, but also realizing how that ties into recovering from trauma. And then when future traumas occur, how to be able to be resilient in those situations. All right, so that's our first icebreaker. We're going to set our intentions and express gratitude. Last session, we talked about um, gratitude, right? Being grateful for the small things, not just not just what we see or what we touch, but also for our feelings. So please put for me in the chat two things that you are grateful for this morning. They could be things that are large, things that are small, but two things that you are grateful for this morning. And Desiree, if you could help me read those, that would be great. Put in the chat for me two things that you are grateful for this morning. Waking up and my family, my hubby who made me a delicious breakfast and time to craft today. Oh, yes. Oh, Julie, I love crafting. I want to just watch you craft. <laughs> so, yes, I appreciate that. Family, yeah. seeing sunshine, spending time with my son and rest. I'm grateful that I have my health and I'm grateful to be around loving friends. They're just coming in all of the gratefulness. Awesome. I love those. And so I, I love the fact that we are grateful for things that maybe before we could have taken for granted, right? Like just being able to, I see somebody says family and seeing the sunshine. So I had a conversation with a coworker the other day that I said, now when I see the sun shining, I have a, a completely different feeling than I had when I saw the sun shining in 2019, right? Because I'm just grateful for feeling the heat for being able to like see it and to be able to be outside, and, you know, especially right now. So just finding gratitude in the small things. Also, it's really important to set your thoughts on intentional gratitude very early in the morning because it helps to set the tone for your day. Okay. And so now let's also set some intentions. What are some of your expectations from this presentation? What are some of your expectations from this presentation? If you could put that for me in the chat, that'll kind of help be my roadmap. Yes, Jennifer, I see that. And congratulations on your second one without any side effects. I'm having lots of side effects, but I'm happy you got it. And when Jennifer said was waking up healthy and being able to take my second COVID vaccine without any side effects. Thank you. Yes, and any expectations for this presentation? And if you have no expectations, that means we're already good. You're gonna like it all already. <laughs> all right, so Desiree, let me know if they come in. I'm gonna go ahead and keep going. Well, I'm gonna one is tools to help me support myself and my students. Yes, thank you so, so much. I appreciate that. And yes, we will, we will get that. So uh, let's take a look at the definition, definition of trauma a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, physical injury, or emotional response to a terrible event, right? That is the definition of trauma. What I want to jump right into, Desiree, because we have lots of information, is to take a look at adverse childhood experiences. So a study was done, the Kaiser study between, I believe it was uh, 95 and 97, and it took a look at middle-class employees, um, about 17,000 people middle class in California um, around that time. And they looked at different 
types of adverse childhood experiences that these people may have had. So I know that my graph is a little hazy, but I wanna tell you that this resource comes from um, the Robert Wood Foundation. It's also on the CDC website. Okay, Talk, take a look, take, took a look at abuse, physical, emotional, and social, possible neglect, physical and emotional, household, household dysfunction as well. And they found that ACEs were extremely prevalent in adults who were middle class, um, who had jobs, who were in California, who were uh, basically white and um, usually from two parent households, right? And they still had adverse childhood experiences. Um, currently, the CDC has reported that 61% of adults report at least one adverse childhood experience right now. Um, and one in six has four or more. So when I saw that number, I was flabbergasted. When I saw the 61%, um, I was like, well, yeah, everybody, everybody has at least one ace, right? But when you take a look at one in six, Desiree, one in six has at least four or more aces. And this is with adults, right? This is shocking. So to actually take a look at some of the prevalency of adverse childhood experiences, let's look over to the right. It says the ACE study revealed the following estimates. Physical abuse, 28%. Sexual abuse, 20%. Emotional abuse, 10%. Neglect, 14%. Physical neglect, because remember it's two different categories when you talk, think about abuse and neglect. There's emotional and there's physical, um, 9%. Household dysfunction. Take a look at the different categories for the ACE study back then. Household substance abuse, parental divorce, mental illness, mother treated violently, and then incarcerated household member, right? And so that's just something to really, really, really think about those different categories. Do you all think that right now that these are the only types of adverse childhood experiences our kiddos or our students are going through or we're going through? Let me know in the chat, do you think that there are more more types of experiences that are that are adverse. People are saying no. That's definitely not the only categories right now. Exactly. So for in the chat for me, Desiree, because you know we like to be interactive on a Saturday. Put some examples of what you think could be labeled as adverse childhood experiences. What are some examples of what you think adverse childhood experiences could be right now, either for us or for our students? And Desiree, thank you for sharing that link in the chat too. Okay, so Dr. Dr. Desiree says, fear of getting shot at school and other public places, yes. Anything else? We have separation from peers. And the link that was in the chat is also on our resources. So if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, it's on the resources, but um, separation from peers. Yes. Um, one of mine, Desiree, now is uh, a pandemic. I've, I've lived through a pandemic, living through a pandemic. Um, one on here also that I do not see is loss, significant loss of more than one immediate family member. Yeah. And we have no access to support network. Surprised yeah. that bullying isn't mentioned in an adverse experience. Yes. I don't know who said that, but yes. Jamar um, Spencer. Jamar, amazing, amazing comment. And that's a, that's a, that's a revelation, right? So not just bullying, but also we have our kids on this technology. So now we have cyber bullying, which we know can be 24 hours a day. And is significant, right? So these are different types of adverse childhood experiences that aren't even listed when this study was done. And so as educators, we have to be aware of adverse childhood experiences, the trauma that they can cause and how they are tied to future trauma and future physical healthcare, 
emotional health care and and possibly you know long-term effects and so just wanted to put this out there and show you all some graphs of what the study is it's a lot of data it's a lot of information but i wanted to show you all some some graphics that kind of you know make it easy to, to look at so right here in the middle it says what impact do aces have so zero aces it's it shows like the graph going up with the risk right so one ace you know, it says ah, risk may be minimal. Two, three, and four plus ACEs, the risk is extremely high for risk outcomes in behavior and physical and mental health. And so when we talk about our students, it's, it's almost like peeling an onion back, the layers of the onion. And the more we find out about our students or about ourselves, the better we are equipped to have healthy coping skills and to kind of be more resilient. Right. And I know Desiree is still filling the chat with great information. So keep checking that. So thank you for that, Desiree. If, if I have any questions at any point, please dive right in. Will do. OK. All right. So here, let me see. Let me pull, I don't want to X that out. OK, here we have the actual um, ACE categories. And I just wanted you to see them clearly. Physical, emotional, sexual, physical and emotional mental illness, mother treated violently, right? And so now we know that we could have father treated violently, right? Substance abuse, incarcerated relative, and divorce. All right, the realms of ACEs. Here it says, and this is also found on the CDC site um, where Desiree put the link. Adverse childhood and community experiences can occur in the household, the community, or in the environment and cause toxic stress. Left unaddressed, toxic stress from ACEs harms children and families, organizations, systems, and communities, and reduces the ability of individuals and entities to respond with resiliency. There's that same word we talked about before, Desiree. We may not be able to respond appropriately when we go through toxic stress. I first heard about toxic stress when I had my little ones, and as babies, babies who are left alone who are left unfed, unchanged, unnurtured, develop toxic stress. And so the same things can happen with us as adults, right? So just taking a look at the tree, household, it has different categories. Jamar, you see your word there, bullying, it's on this one, right? Because somebody had to devise the realms of ACEs. It's so much more than just those categories that we first saw with that Kaiser study, right? But bullying is here. We have maternal depression, homelessness, we also have community, lack of jobs, discrimination, historical trauma, right? Because we know now that there are different levels of trauma, not just what we see on the surface, but also what's below. Lack of social capital and mobility, poor water and air quality, you all. Food scarcity, substandard wages, right? And then we also have the environment. For me, I've spoken to you all about my situation with still dealing with the effects of Hurricane Katrina. So natural disasters for our students, volcano eruptions, tsunamis, earthquakes, a pandemic is now listed, record storms, wildfires, record heat and droughts. And so I love to see this graphic because it allows, it allows us to see the categories of different types of trauma in relation to the household, the community and the environment. But it's also, you know, it, 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 it categorizes nicely and it's easy to see. Okay, any questions so far, Desiree? No, I just wanted to add with food scarcity, I was also thinking about healthy food scarcity. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely food scarcity in itself, but also, you know, what our students have, or just ourselves have access to when it comes to healthy food as well. Yeah. Um, Jamar says, I would argue that children who are for forced to grow up faster than their peers to be on the realm of trauma. Yeah, Jamar, and, we've, and we found, especially now with the pandemic, with our students who had, who had to stay in a home where there was already abuse and neglect, being separated from schools where us as educators would be the people to allow, allow them for um, comfort, education, love, compassion, meals, right? tutoring help when they were at home because they had to be, they they would be those children who were forced, forced to grow up a little bit faster and take care of their younger siblings and run a household. And so I think that we can all agree 
that we see those students now at a deficit, right? And so you're exactly right about that, putting them on that realm of trauma. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and that's something for us to also think about as educators when we have to meet certain benchmarks, we still have standards to meet, we're still expecting them to take tests and to perform, you know, to a certain level of expectation, but is that really fair? And I think, did he put something else up, Desiree? Um, yes, he said many of the issues that I experienced as a youth seem to be magnified with this generation. Yes. Yes, definitely. And, and I think the thing that you just said about, you know, is that fair? I think one of the things we need to also consider is how are our educators themselves getting help with the, you know, with the aces of their, of, you know, of, that they're dealing with too. And the things that we're dealing with. So I think it's a lot more help is needed. Yes, without a doubt without a doubt across the board. And so what, what we'll cover a little bit later, but I'll just give some of my, some of what I've, I've had to do. I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm just going to speak to it. I feel overwhelmed. Um, I have in the past felt underappreciated. I currently don't. Um, as an educator, I have felt burnout um, and extreme stress. And in the pandemic, educating my own children and others was a lot. It's still a lot because I still have expectations for me as a professional educator. Um, but what I am working to do is radical self-care and learning to say no. Learning to say I have to draw boundaries for my own sanity um, and for my health and well-being. Um, I didn't want to say no to you today, Desiree, because believe it or not, you all are my self-care today. I know I've said that like every month, but, but you are. But other things I'm learning to say no and take time for myself because, because the burnout is real. And as educators, we are a thousand and one things to everybody, right? So find it, finding that time for ourselves and to reach out to those of us who are friends and professionals and say, I need your help. You know, I need a listening ear. Thursday night, I did a talk about talking to, talking to therapists, going and finding a counselor. And it is okay to do that to release, to relieve some pressure and some stress as an educator, I support that. Okay, so thank you, Desiree, for reminding me of that. All right, so here are three types of trauma. So we have acute, chronic, and complex. And let me go ahead and dive into what each one really is, okay? So acute trauma, all right? Symptoms of acute trauma may include severe panic or extreme anxiety, confusion, irritation, disassociation of feelings, being disconnected from yourself, your surroundings, insomnia, suspicious acting in strange ways, lack of self-care, poor grooming, loss of focus, production at work or school. All right. Um, and so here are several treatment strategies for acute trauma. It talks about immediate emotional support, kind of like what we just talked about, removal from the scene of trauma, short-term use of medication, short-term trauma counseling to return to the feeling of being safe and to your own sense of normal. Chronic trauma. Chronic trauma, is, unlike in the case of acute, has symptoms such as extended period of time, um, cases even years after the event can occur. Longer term reactions, unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, anxiety, rage, and even physical symptoms like fatigue, headaches, and nausea. Survivors of chronic trauma will likely require more treatment, have longer pain, and um, may, be hand, may, be, may need an outside psychologist or trauma counseling for long term. And then we have complex trauma usually interpersonal, which occurs between people, involves a feeling of being trapped, often uh, planned, extreme, ongoing, and or repeated, and has more severe and persistent impacts. It involves challenges over, over time, trust, self-esteem, and may even have emotions of shame. May involve coping strategies such as alcohol, drug use, self-harm, or over, the count, over or under eating. Okay, it affects emotional and physical health, overall well being, relationships, and daily functionings. And so, this usually occurs um, if a child 
has trauma at home or in a situation and it is repeated and has been damaging to them emotionally or physically, complex trauma in childhood can occur in forms of child abuse, neglect, adverse childhood experiences, so we're tying it back in, community violence, domestic and family violence, civil unrest, okay, trauma, genocide, cultural dis dislocation, um, sexual exploitation, and even trafficking. And so I wanted to give like the specific information I pulled from the CDC website, because with complex trauma, I am finding more um, student referrals from students who, who, are, who are actively in complex trauma situations. And so um, put for me in the chat, if you know of any of these areas where either you or your students um, have gone through any one and which one you found more prominent in your area. So for me, I can without a doubt say complex. any one of these traumas or more that you found um, either with friends, family, or students in the chat for me, if you don't mind sharing. And Desiree, you wanna add anything? No, I'm just kind of taking it all in, but Jill it's says heavy. acute. Yes, so thank you for that. Anybody Jennifer else? says complex. Jamar says sad to say that my students and myself experience all three. Yes. Oh my goodness. And so with this, y'all, this is so heavy to even talk about, but I think it's it's so important for us to share this information because when you hear the word trauma, you know, I automatically think physical all the time. And I have always thought physical and start out until I started doing these types of presentations, but it's so many different layers to it, right? And so being aware of the different types and then being able to have conversations, healthy conversations um, with family members, with friends and with our students will allow us to be able to identify which areas um, have affected us. And then we can work on what types of things can allow us to begin a healing process or to even start a process in general. So thank you all for sharing. Anybody else? Janya says chronic. Um, th uh, this session is making me think about how many of us educators need to unpack our own trauma. Yes. And I yes. think it's Mafuza says that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I think I've said each session, that's where I keep talking about Katrina. And I actually had coworkers years ago tell me, well, you need to get over that. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I can't like, and I feel inadequate and it hurts to see other people hurt when they go through natural disasters and loss. And then it wasn't until Desiree, you know this, it wasn't until I started doing this type of work with eye care that I was able to say, it's not just the rainwater. It's not just the loss of, of my home and things, but I realized, I had to realize that Katrina directly or indirectly caused my father to pass away five years later. And so I had to, like you said, unpack is a really good way to put it, especially for our students. I had to backtrack why I was so upset, why I was so taken aback, what things happened that led to him passing, other family members passing. And it was that storm started that ball rolling for me, part of those adverse childhood experiences it just started to build up, right? And I mean, to the point to where I can still feel the physical pain of what I felt and then the emotional and stress of what I thought and how I felt in my head. So for people who are not able to articulate that, like our little ones right now, I have a six-year-old in a pandemic our little kids, our kindergartners are upset. They can't play on the playground with each other. They have to wear a mask. Why can't I hug my classmates, you know? So unpacking all of those things right now, um, I think is, is a good start for us because we keeping it all in is detrimental to our physical health and our emotional and mental health as well. So 
this is a this is a great start for us. It, it, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it hurts sometimes to go through it, but I but I appreciate you all um with us this morning to to even talk about this topic. And Desiree, I thank you again for having us. This is a lot. Anything else in the chat? Um, Jamar says more so in recent years, the amount of civil unrest has not only affected the students, but their families and teachers as well. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree, Jamar. I've had um, some little students under the age of 10 come to me and say that they don't feel safe anywhere because of what they see and because of what they feel. And so when our students don't feel safe, then that means that their needs are not being met. When we think about Maslow's higher gear needs, our students need to feel safe. If they don't feel safe, then they are not able to learn. And so, and that that process continues. We have, we have higher risk factors there than we have protective factors. So thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? <clears throat> No, you can move on. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have two main categories of trauma. So type one, here we go. Explained as a single incident, traumas that are unexpected and come out of the blue, they can be referred to as the big T. Shock acute trauma. PTSD, aha, is linked to the big T trauma. So I wanted to definitely give my example of Katrina because that's mine. I have PTSD when it rains. I have certain emotions. I'm feeling things. I can, ah, I'm going crazy because it is acute trauma, right? So that's type one. Let's take a look at type two. Type two, complex trauma describes which may have been an experience as a part of childhood, early stages of development. Here we go. Repetitive trauma, condition related, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, Historical, collective, or intergenerational trauma, okay? Vicarious or secondary trauma and can be called little t trauma. So with the historical, collective, or intergenerational, um, Jamar, we talk about the civil unrest, uh, what our parents may have gone through watching TV as of lately or watching the news or hearing certain things that could also be a part of historical, collective, or intergenerational trauma, okay? So these are different areas. I implore you to take a look deeper into the type ones and type twos um, when you can just dive more into it and kind of see if you have any ties to any of these specific areas. And if your students do it, to just have open, safe conversations about that. All right, I love, love this example. I think I gave you like a snippet of it last time and now we can talk more about it. Trauma recovery as illustrated by an avocado. So I'm trying to eat better with healthy fats, Desiree. So I found the avocado, the outer peel, what people on the outside see. Often they see bumps, but otherwise you're doing fine. Everything looks good. On the inside, the feelings, the squishy goo, all of the feelings, plus mental health symptoms, somatic symptoms, triggers, disassociation, et cetera. And then the pit, that part that I'm always surprised about that's inside of an avocado that you just can't crunch your teeth. Traumatic memories, beliefs about self or the world that are based in trauma. And look at this word, and shame. Part of, I think, people's difficulty with talking about trauma or having these types of conversations is... Number one, because they have not been taught how to have these conversations, but also fear and shame. If I come up, come out and I say that this happened to me and I feel this way and I'm still being affected, then are you going to judge me? Are you going to downplay it? Are you going to dismiss my feelings? So that trauma and shame. Um, what are you all's thoughts about this, this particular graphic and the outer peel, the goo and the pit? How do you feel about this? <laughs> Please let me know in the chat. I think some people never quite get to the pit, unfortunately, when self-reflecting. I think we definitely, the outer pill is what, you know, people see. I think we sometimes get to the top layer of the squishy goo, but I think for a lot of us, we don't get to the pit and we don't know why the squishy goo is the way it is and what's actually affecting the squishy goo. 
Yeah. I like that, Desiree, because um, when you say you get to like the top part of the squishy goo, like that's triggers, right? So something something triggers to remind you about that trauma or something, you know, that, that post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder kicks in and then you kind of, you know, you don't even go deep to where where the memories are or wanting to find out more about it. We just immediately put immediately put that wall up. So that's that's something to really think about. Anything else? Anybody else in the chat? Excellent correlation, especially comparing what can be seen and discovered versus what's buried in the pit, says Jamar. Janice yeah. says the first step is admitting that we have experienced trauma before we can get to the layers. Yes, I love that. I don't know who said that, but the first thing about many, many of the, the topics we covered is it has been acknowledgement to acknowledge the fact that we all are, go, are currently in some form of trauma. I'm gonna say that again. Currently, Desiree, we are all in some form of trauma. Now, if, if it's acute, chronic, complex, type one, type two, that varies from person to person. But, but currently in the pandemic, we are all going through some layer of that. And so I appreciate you all taking a look at my avocado now I'm hungry, but um, this is something just to think about. And so I, I would encourage you to take this uh, graphic. I think I can share it with you all for the resource link um, in our, all of our resources over the months. And you can take this and use this at your school sites or wherever you would like to. Um, and just to have a, a conversation, I think it would be great. All right, so we've already uh, dived into discussion examples and thoughts, so I'll skip over that slide. Let's take a look at triggers. We saw in the goo, that the word triggers was there and this uh, disassociation. So in mental health, the definition of triggers refers to something that affects your emotional state, can cause extreme overwhelm or distress, affects your ability to remain present in the moment, and may bring up thought patterns or influence your behavior. All right, internal triggers. Here are some examples. Loneliness, anger, sadness, grief, feeling vulnerable, memories, muscle tension, and feeling pain. And so by muscle tension, meaning on the inside, right? Um, external triggers, news programs, movies or TV shows, certain smells, dates on the calendar is one of mine. My friend calls me a calendar griever because I can tell you the date everybody passed away. And anytime it comes up on the calendar, I'm like, oh, I can feel it. It's just, that's just my thing. Um, places or locations that remind you of an event and certain people can be external triggers, especially for um, our abuse survivors. And if you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat. All right. And so let me go back to this. Do you all agree or disagree with this, with these internal or external triggers? Agree or disagree? Desiree, you agree or disagree? Absolutely agree. Okay. And everyone is saying the same. All right. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do a quick brain break. So I'm going to do it for about a, a nice 30 seconds because I know we're going to get short on time. But I want everybody just to take a deep breath in through your nose for me. And out through your mouth. Nice and slow. We're going to breathe in through our noses again and out through our mouths. And this time I want you to breathe in and think, breathe in love and exhale peace. And let's do that together. Good. And so Sometimes it's a lot of heavy information. So I'd like to take a, just a small break to breathe. And if you are looking for more breathing techniques, more mindfulness, mindfulness techniques, you can go to Desiree's YouTube channel where we've done mindfulness and meditative sessions. And you can look into some of those. And I know we have a huge one coming up, Zen Within. Okay, so what do we do as educators? We identify Mavs Law's hierarchy of needs. We talked about this. We look at 
physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization. -actual and this is where we want to be. And this is what we want our students to be. We want them to be motivated intrinsically to be the very best that they can, that they can be at all times. We can change our views. You can snap this or you can get it from the YouTube channel. I love this. We have traditional views as educators, right? Student has anger management. The student has ADHD put on medicine. The student is choosing to act out. This student is crazy. This student is working my nerves. This student is non-responsive. Student needs consequences or medication. But the trauma-informed view changes that a little bit. The student is non-adaptive is using non-adaptive responses and need, his needs need to be met. The student has difficulty self-regulating. She was triggered. The student lacks the necessary skills to cope properly in a healthy way. The student doesn't trust adults, right? We talked about this. The student has a negative view of the world. How can I better assist the student to know that they are safe with me and I am here as an advocate for him or her? Uh, Trauma-informed response. The student needs to develop self-regulation skills and develop trusting relationships. So not only do we need to, to develop trusting relationships, we need to encourage our students to do the same thing. And Desiree, you put something in my, on my mind. So when I do this presentation later, even though we're here as educators to help our students, we also need to help ourselves because we are going through trauma as well. So um, a traditional view for us as a teacher could be, you know, I got in trouble because I didn't meet the mark for the leak pretest. You know, I'm a counselor and I wasn't able to set up the testing strategies properly, you know, but a trauma informed view would be, I need to extend grace to myself and to others because we're going through unprecedented times but also I'm doing the very best I can do right now, you know? So extending grace to ourselves is, is, is going to be vital as we continue. Persistence, the firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. Or opposition. We are persistent. Educators, um, you are phenomenal. <laughs> We persist. We continue on. We are here on a Saturday to get resources and more information about a topic that is tough. We are superheroes. Okay. Helping a student with PTSD. Love this graphic as well. This young lady reminds me of myself. She's standing on a desk throwing a sheet of paper at her teacher. Other kids are sitting there and it says here, help that student with predictability being able to be consistent, being supportive, not changing, helping that student keep their attention on positive things, having alternative discipline, not punitive, being non-judgmental. When we talked about the definition of mindfulness months ago, part of that definition is to be aware and conscious of the inside and the outside present, but to also be non-judgmental of yourself and that student. And also this question, the, asking this question and hearing the answer has changed my life over the past year and a half. Ask how you can help. Talking to people intentionally with a genuine heart and saying, are you okay? And then waiting for the response. And then how can I help? And then waiting for that response. Um, Desiree has been a godsend for me and my family over the past two, three months, she asked me a question, are you okay? And I felt like I could just be vulnerable with her and say, no, I'm not all right, sister, I'm not okay. And how can I help? And, and she helped in a way that will stick with me for the rest of my life. And so I think just being that person for other people, um, we have that responsibility as educators because our end goal, one of our end goals is to teach children but before we can even get there right now, we have to see how we can help them along the way to process everything that's going on. And then also we need to be comfortable with asking for help ourselves because we are going through a lot. All right, protective versus risk factors. Uh, protective factors, we are protective factors as educators. Um, caring friends, being resilient, 
identifying areas in children's neighborhoods that are safe. Uh, for us, we have the YMCA, we have BREC, we have uh, local churches, um, having academic achievement and parent connectiveness on campuses is very important. So all of these things help to keep our students um, processing through active trauma, leading them towards academic success and behavioral success. And that's what we really want. More mindfulness, we talked about the definitions again, being conscious and aware, acknowledging your feelings and being non-judgmental. We know that the mind and the body are connected. We've talked about self-care, the importance of self-care, not only for our students, but for ourselves. The term I say again, there's a, is radical self-care and co-mindfulness is being able to listen versus being able to listen to respond. So we wanna listen to hear, not just listen to respond. All right, resilience, I love this word, being able to bounce back, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness, the ability to spring back into shape. And the more resilient we are, over time, we're able to still go through situations because there are things beyond our control, but we're able to cope better. We talked last month about gratitude fueling resilience. The more gratitude we're able to identify, I'm still thankful for toilet paper in a pandemic. I'm thankful for having eggs. I'm thankful for educator friends on a Saturday morning when I don't feel so well. I'm thankful for my children, um, for the life of my mother, who is a strong woman and continues to sew into me. And I'm, I'm thankful for my students who keep me young and vibrant and who show me how to do TikTok videos, right? So something like that, that allows you to be able to smile on the outside and make your heart smile on the inside helps to equip you for tough situations down the road and to be more resilient. So just helping our students to identify these types of things is, is helpful. Love this quote, taking care of yourself helps to keep your mind and your body primed to deal with situations that require resilience. Taking care of yourself helps to keep your mind and your body primed to deal with situations that require resilience. Okay, establish mindful activities and self-care plans in your classroom. We're not gonna practice. <laughs> We've done it before. You can go to Desiree's YouTube channel to check those out. All right, and self-care practices help to build resilience. We've shared this before, Desiree. Make time for closest friends. Talk about what you're going through. Reframe your difficult experiences and thoughts and turn them into learning experiences. Try to avoid catastrophic thinking and learn from others who model resilience. Prioritize exercise, sleep, a healthy diet, and drink lots of water. A lot of our students, are thirsty. I encourage them to drink water and to have good gut health. Take a break from media, keep it simple and practice relaxation techniques as much as possible. We talked about that term radical self-care. Normally, if you go get a massage, now I need you to get it 50 times because you deserve it and you need it. All right. Relaxation and resilience are tied in. We need both relaxation techniques that we have covered before. And with the Zen Within workshop, Desiree, we're gonna do all these in detail. Breath focus, body scan, guided imagery, mindfulness and meditation, chair yoga, and repetitive mantras and affirmations. All right, the five minute guided meditation that I love is on YouTube. I think we've shared that resource before. And I wanted to share this data again from the CDC. Feeling connected to family and school has long lasting positive effects on adolescents well into adulthood. Strong connections to family and school lead to decreases in violence, multiple sex partners, prescription misuse, emotional distress, infections, and illicit drug use. So if our students are connected to family and school, these things decrease for them, which means they can have success as adults in the future. I saw something fly across me. I'm sorry. School and family connections in adolescence linked to positive health outcomes in adulthood. Check this out. Youth experience risks, 
17% of students considered attempting suicide. 19% have been bullied at school. 14% misused prescription pain medicine. How can schools and family providers help? We can implement positive youth development programs. Parents can have frequent and open conversations and providers can discuss relationships and school experiences. Adults who experience strong connections as youth were less likely to have mental health issues, experience violence, engage in risky behaviors, and use substances by 48 to 66%. That's huge as adults. But as, as teens, we were major positive protective factors. Thoughts and experiences, comments, or questions, I'll take those now, Desiree. I thank you for letting me go over, I think, like a minute or two. I appreciate that. No, you're actually right on time. Uh, so, <laughs> you did it. Um, so thank you so, so much, Tanya. I, If you have any questions or any comments, you can put them in the chat. The evaluation is also in the chat. So thank you so very much, Tanya. Again, th these have just been invaluable. And when she says go back to the YouTube channel and look at the other ones, like we've had ones where we were breathing in chairs and we were doing all kinds of stuff. So really do go back because this is a true series where she's building on each one every time. So thank you so much, Tanya. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I, I, I must say today has been a struggle, you all, because I really don't feel well, but I appreciate you showing up. And so that's what we do, right, Desiree? We show up even in the midst of, and so we want to make sure that we have balance. And so in that balance, right, when I get off from you all, I'm going to love on my kiddos, do one more activity, and then I'm going to deep breathe. I'm going to have some nice hot tea with lemon and ginger, and I'm going to relax. And then I'm also very excited about our upcoming session, Sensational Social Emotional Learning Practices. So I wanted to make sure I put that up. But I thank you so much this morning, everybody, for your comments and your participation. And I hope that you dive into um, some deep conversations with, with your friends, your family members, and your students about trauma because they don't even know they're going through it. So just to ask them how they're doing and how you can help will open up that avocado for them.